Greetings, I'm Shad, I'm talking about the katana, and specifically I'll be talking about how the katana is made. Now I have already given an introduction on as, as to why I'm even doing this, and I've also talked about what the katana is made out of, which really leads into this subject, because Understanding what the katana is made out of makes necessary everything that I'm going to be talking about now, which is how the katana is made. So please do watch the previous videos if you haven't watched them already. Now funny, I say how the katana is made. Perhaps a better um, a title for this video is why the katana is made the way it is, because it doesn't take too much research to find out how the katana is made. You can just look online and you're like, oh look, folding, oh look, differential hardening, there you go, magic. We have a katana. And you might be very familiar with that process already. If not, you'll probably get a brief rundown of how it is as I talk about the more finer details in regards to how it's made and also why. Because of the technology of the day, specifically feudal age technology, the iron ore that has been collected and then been smelted down into the steel you would hope for ready for being made is still full of impurities. Why is that the case? Because generally, it's funny, people say that um, the smelting process or the um, the smelter device called the Tatara that is used in traditional Tamahagane production, um, it, it is said to be an ingenious or really, really efficient smelting device. Well, let's look at that because the smelting process is very crucial, okay? Whenever you get any type of iron ore, you've mined it, you've dug it out, it's gonna have impurities in, okay? It'll be very rare to have very pure stuff that you've just been able to dig up off out of the ground or shovel out of the sand on the iron or sand or whatever. It's very, very rare to have pure stuff of that, okay? And that is the case for the entire world, all right? So, it's the smelting process where you're going to first tackle this issue about impurities in the iron. And something else. Now, it's funny, in regards to impurities in the iron, you're also actually going, apart from taking out impurities, you're going to want to put some impurities in. The type of impurity that is good in this case is carbon, all right? Because when you add carbon to iron and impurify the iron in that regard, guess what you make? You make steel, all right? And you want steel out of this process. So you want to make steel, and you essentially do that by adding different types of impurities into the iron, and you want to remove the other impurities and what these impurities are, are sulfates and silicates and bits of rock and crud and dirt that's all being mixed in there. Now, first of all, why does adding carbon to iron make it into steel? Well, steel is essentially, a, it's a form of iron, like I said, with carbon in, but it's a lot, it's a lot stronger than iron, okay? It's a harder and stronger, therefore superior, and we like to make things out of steel because it's pretty darn good. How this works is simply that iron atoms are larger than carbon atoms, all right? And so when you melt iron down into a liquid form, those atoms, they're, they're, how they uh, bond to one another, change their structure slightly to allow carbon atoms, which are smaller, to kind of seep in and through. And of course it's a liquid anyway, so they can seep in and get mixed up in there anyway. But when, they, when, this, uh, when the iron hardens, okay, their structure changes back to their normal state when they're in a solid state, and they trap those carbon atoms in between the iron atoms which makes it harder for the iron atoms to move and flex around which makes the overall structure stronger and so steel is good with swords even better yes steel good for swords iron of course you can make swords out of iron but they're not as good as the ones made out of steel so then how do you remove the stuff that you don't want in the iron all the, the crap the crud and the word for these things that you don't want in the iron these um non-metallic inclusions is funny technically carbon is a non metallic inclusion but when I say that and it's funny I'm not the only one who uses this terminology we're not referring to the carbon we're referring to all the crap we don't want and so these non-metallic inclusions they are called slag <laughs> that's what we call slag in Australia maybe you call it you know spitting just you know it's, it's you know your slag <laughs> anyway now slag is very very bad especially in you know well any real steel structure having slag in it is bad because slag well it's silicates it's rock it's crap it's not strong okay and so wherever there is not steel within a steel beam structure or whatever is a very fatal weak point in that steel and so if there is a large deposit of slag well guess where that steel structure or whatever is going to break where the slag is because 
again, it's not strong, all right? And so slag is very, very bad. You wanna get rid of all of it if you could. So how do you get rid of slag? Well, you first start, well, how you do it is you need to melt the iron, the steel, all right? You need to make it fully liquid. Now that is hard. It requires heating up the steel to 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is 1600 degrees Celsius. Now you might think, oh yeah, sure, heat it up that much, just put more coal in the fire, I get it hotter. <laughs> it's not as easy as that. It's actually quite hard to get things that hot. So hard, in fact, that it was very hit and miss. It's funny, we have cases of some cultures re developing smelting technology that could heat up iron to that temperature at earlier parts in history. And so we think that they might have, there are, might be cases of people discovering this in maybe India um, and other kind of, uh, you know, areas around there. And indeed, we, we believe, we think that um, it is those uh, iron ingots that were produced in this superior way that were then traded up in towards, you know, the, the areas where Vikings lived and where the Ulfbert was built. The Ulfbert blades, if you, you know, have heard about them, um, were made out of far superior steel than that then was generally able to be found or manufactured in that period of time. And so even though there were certain parts in the world in earlier times in history um, with, with examples of cultures that had smelting technology of this level, it really only became more widespread, no more readily, you know, developed when you get around to say the 15th century in Europe. And there might even be cases of it being developed a bit earlier than that. But what I'm trying to say is Heating up steel to that temperature is very difficult to do. And uh, for most parts, most places in the world, they didn't have their technology, and that includes Japan, okay? The Tatara is only um, capable of reaching and maintaining temperatures of up to 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. That's around 1,500 degrees Celsius. Now that is hot! but it's actually not hot enough. At those temperatures, iron will not fully liquefy, and that's a problem, okay? Because if you want to get rid of slag in the iron, it has to become completely liquefied, and when it is, that slag will rise to the surface, and there's other, there are methods of doing that. Sometimes um, people have put, like, glass in the iron, which gives the uh, slag something to bond to, and then when it melts, it'll all float to the surface. And when it's on the surface, well, they can either let the iron set and just, you know, kind of chip off the top, or, s or scrape it off the top um, while the iron is in a liquid form. If in the smelting process, the steel is not brought to the proper temperatures, which is 3000 degrees Fahrenheit, the slag will remain in it. And that is actually the case with the Tatara. The Tatara does not reach high enough temperatures to remove slag out of the steel. And so that means the steel that you get as a result of it is gonna have a decent amount of impurities in it. Now, that's no real special thing. That's actually what is commonly found throughout most of history and in most cultures. So we shouldn't bag on the Japanese and the Tatara for being crap. No, because it is efficient. It does make steel. And that's important because you want steel in, out of the process. It is just not pure steel. It has a lot of non-metallic inclusions in their slag, which is, you know, it's crap. And so... The, the thing that happens then, if your smelting technology does not get rid of the slag in your steel, you need a forging technique that can then kind of do the, uh, fix the problem for you. And so that's kind of the give and take. You either have smelting technology up to par, or you have a forging technique up to par that solves the issue and can make a functional and indeed even a superior blade in, as the result. Now, I'm not saying that when I say superior, that all katanas are superior to other swords. I'm just saying, no, you can make a superior blade through this process, just like you can make superior blades in the processes that were used in Europe. Now, I have read statements um, that say to the effect that um, the fact that the Tatara could not reach the right temperatures to make the iron fully liquefied was intentional. Now, I actually, I, I don't fully believe that, okay, um, because if they had the technology to get it to get the iron to fully liquefy, well, 
there are far better reasons why you would want steel that has no impurities in it before you get into the forging stage. And I'll get to that, why that's important. Because when you forge steel, you're also doing something which is detrimental to the finished product. Even though you're helping it, you're also doing something that's not helping it, and that something is largely unknown that I have found. I didn't know it until I read about it after doing a hell of a lot of digging. And I don't mean to hang a carrot in front of you and say, I'm not going to tell you now. Look, it, it's in regards to decarburization. Decarbur all right, we'll get there. But getting back to this statement as to that um, the Tataran, you know, being designed or being not being able to fully liquefy the steel being that it's intentional. And the reasons they give is that they get different grades of steel as a result, meaning that the carbon content, the carbon that they're shoveling into this iron in the Tatara doesn't fully spread out evenly. And so as a result, you get different grades of steel, a steel that is harder with a higher carbon content and steel that is softer with a lower carbon content. And they say that's intentional because, and the reason is that when you make a katana, a katana is actually made out of three different grades of steel. And so when you say it's made out of tamahagane, which is the steel that's made in a katana, it's funny, that's correct yet incorrect. Tamahagane actually only comprises one third of the end product sword. The other two types of steel that goes into katana manufacturing, and I'm going to mispronounce them, so I apologize, but it's Hocho Tetsu and Nabegame. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've mispronounced them. Could be Namagame, or, but I think it's Nabe, Nabegame. Nabegame, I think. I think. So we have Hocho Tetsu, Tamahagane, and Namagame. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Nab nabe game. Anyway, three types of steel, and each one of those types of steel can be get well retrieved out of the lump of steel that you have as a result of the uh, Tatara smelting process. And they determine that by how shiny the steel is, how kind of silvery it is, because that determines its internal carbon content, or is simply an indicator of its internal carbon content. Now we come to a uh, subject that was mentioned in the previous video, and that is the subject of pig iron because there is a you know a perception out there that the katana is made out of pig iron and it's said in a derisive kind of fashion saying it's made out of pig iron how great can that be because pig iron doesn't really sound too good does it when you say it's pig iron i mean the names of things that are generally of high quality do not have pig in them. Okay, well let's clear this up because remember how I said Tamahagane only comprises a third of the end result of a katana? Well, first of all, Tamahagane is not pig iron, okay? It's not at all, all right? What is pig iron is the nabegame, all right? That third and last type of iron that they use in katana manufacture, which also comprises a third of the finished result. So when they say that a katana is made out of pig iron, well, yes, it is. And no, it isn't uh, because it's only a third. Now, is that a bad thing? Actually, no. If um, if pig iron wasn't used in the way that the katana is forged, um, the resulting sword would be a bit too soft. It wouldn't be strong enough. Well, that's kind of odd. I thought pig iron was bad. Well, this is the thing. Though pig iron is used in making a katana, by the end of the forging process, it's no longer pig iron, all right? You see, pig iron is an intermediate state, all right? And let me tell you what it is. It is actually iron with an exceptionally high amount of carbon in it, which actually makes it steel. And so, funny thing, pig iron is actually a state of steel. I don't know why I call it pig iron. Uh, probably it would have been more accurate to call it pig steel, but it's called pig iron. Who knows why? Maybe they didn't want to call it steel because you would never have an end result like anything that is made out of steel, its finished state, you would never have it in pig iron because it would be too brittle, it's too hard, all right? And it's not adequate for anything, uh, say anything to be made out of, it's funny. It's, you would never have anything made out of it that is it, when it is in its final state, it would be in pig iron. You would never have that. But a lot of things are made out of pig iron if it has extensive forging in its manufacture. And there is a reason for this. And I mentioned that word, remember? 
It was called decarburization. That's the reason. See, I mentioned that decarburization can be a bad thing if you are overforging something. Now, what this is, what decarburization is, is loss of carbon in the steel, okay? And that can happen. And that happens when you forge steel in a furnace. And so the surface layer of steel, because it's so hot, everything is loose again. It means those carbon atoms can then be bonded to oxygen. And that is what we can, what we understand and know as burning. Carbon burns. Why do we put wood into a fire? Because it's carbon and it burns. But that, I mean, it's not a surprise that carbon burns because oxygen is a vicious element, all right? It tries to bond with anything. It's very aggressive. And so oxidization happens in so many other elements. And so you know of carbon dioxide because that's when oxygen and carbon bonds. Well, you've probably heard of hydrogen dioxide or H2O, which is called water. So yes, oxygen, very aggressive. But see, carbon, carbon is very open to being bonded with lots of things. In fact, it's, it's even open to being bonded with itself. And that's why carbon is the basis for life because it can make these long molecules of itself all made out of carbon, hence we're carbon-based life forms. And so the carbon in steel will be stolen by the oxygen in the air when it's heated up, all right? Now, that might not be too much of an issue. It can be an issue because it means the surface layer of steel has a lower carbon content than the internal layer of steel. And so, like, with uh, if it's forged a bit too much, if it's exposed to heat for a bit too long, yes, the carbon ratings will change from the surface to the interior. That might not be too much of a problem because the internal steel is still at the same, same rate. But what if you start forging that steel specifically? What if you want, it, what if you have slag content in there that you want to, one, homogenize and also burn out? So that means you're gonna fold it or twist it or whatever to try and knead the steel, just like kneading a piece of dough um, to spread out all its internal properties and to make the carbon um, uh, level uniform throughout the entire piece. But that means much more of the internal steel will be getting moved closer to the surface, surface and vice versa. It's getting all mixed around, which means a much higher rate of decarburization can take place. And so it's actually a bit of give and take. So we're gonna remember this, okay? When you forge steel, decarburization happens, which means you lose carbon, okay? And so if you want the end product to still be of a, the right carbon grade, that means the beginning time Type of steel that you use before you forge it needs to be of a higher carbon grade and that is called pig iron and then it gets forged and it loses carbon throughout the process but the final piece is going to be of the right carbon content isn't it but all of this is only necessary if forging is necessary repeated forging specifically and I'm talking about the folding of the steel okay because if you're going to do lots of folding then yes you're going to be losing carbon but the thing is the reason why you fold it is that carbon isn't the only thing that burns remember how you know vicious oxygen is oxygen is going to burn off a lot of other stuff as well and that includes silicates and other crap like that as well. Oh, that's interesting. And so the slag that is in there can also be burnt off if you're gonna forge it. And this, this comes into one of the concepts that I have had a lot of trouble to try and uncover the truth of, and that is the concept of does folding remove impurities? The Katana fanboys say that it does and it's a crucial and it's this ingenious process to make a beautiful sword. And the Katana Bashes says, no, it doesn't remove impurities. It homogenizes the impurities to make them even. And so there's not one you know, big buildup of slag in one location in the blade where it would snap. It's spread out to make a, an effective blade as an end result. Something that can be used, but it's nowhere near, you know, pure or free of impurities. So what is the answer? Does folding remove impurities or not? Well, it's funny. Yes and no. Okay, it, it, and it took me a lot of research to find this out. It can remove impurities the same way that decarburization can happen by folding it. You're kneading that steel, moving all its internals around to make more steel closer to the surface than it was before, which means oxygen can penetrate deeper in the steel, and the hotter it is, the deeper the oxygen can, you know, snag these things and burn things out of the steel. And so you will actually be burning off impurities through a forging process, specifically folding or twisting or whatever. And so this is the, like, much of what I'm saying here, nearly all of it, applies equally as much to pattern welding. The reasons why and what happens and what you need to start, what type of steel you need to start out with to begin with, all these things come into play with pattern welding as much as folding. 
Now, interesting, so the hotter the steel is, the deeper decarburization and indeed burning off of any other impurities can take place. Generally, it would happen at 0.3 of a mil deep into the surface, but the hotter the steel gets, the deeper the oxygen or can burn off things in the steel. And so, yes, all right, there, that, that's the answer. Folding can remove impurities. Does it remove all impurities? No, no, it does not. And so it's funny, <laughs> again, we come to the truth. Finally, we come to the truth. Does folding purify steel? No, it doesn't. It can remove a lot of impurities, but there are one, there's one kind of type of impurity that it actually can't remove. Because remember, the folding process needs the steel, moving all the internals around, so what was inside comes close to the surface, which enables oxygen to burn off, and yada, 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 all right? So it does that, but what about the things that have already been oxidized? Because remember, oxygen would generally only bond with something that has not been bonded to by oxygen already. And I mean, more oxygen molecules can bond, but it's a give and take. How many atoms are there of each of our kind to enable the bonding to take place? So try and burn ash or, you know, carbon dioxide. You're not going to really have much luck in it because it's already oxidized. So what that means is, well, let's take a step back. Remember, that iron ore was a type of iron oxide, which means it was already fully oxidized. And so it, in the smelting process, you will be able to release a lot of that oxygen atoms that are bonded to the iron through the heat. But does that happen to everything in there? No, it actually doesn't. There is a lot of oxides that will remain in the steel and oxygen can't burn it out because it's already been bonded to it. And so folding of steel will remove a lot of impurities, but nowhere near all of them. And so remember it when I said, well, what would be better, having forging technology uh, sorry, having smelting technology up to scratch or a forging process that can kind of fix the problems that your smelting process left. It's better to have the smelting process because the, there is no way to forge something and remove all the impurities. It, it can't be done. It can remove a decent amount, but not all of them. But you can remove nearly all those impurities at the smelting stage of something. And so it's far better to smelt something properly than it is to forge something with a fancy technique to clear out impurities. So what this means is that traditionally made katanas in a proper historical way with historically gathered iron ore in the, in the correct way is actually going to have impurities in it. Far more impurities than um, any sword that was made out of a more advanced smelting technology. But why take my word for that, okay? Because in the end of the day, I'm just one guy saying that traditionally made katanas are not perfectly pure. They will have slag content in them, specifically the oxi oxidized slag, all right? They're already oxidized slag that can't be removed from forging. So why take my word for that? Because I didn't find this out just from hearing it from some Joe Burrow. I did some research and guess what? I found an actual study done by people who are smarter than me. <clears throat> printed this off and it's funny I actually found this uh, about a year or so ago I haven't bothered to try and refine the website that I found it on um, and I'm, I'll try before I post this video but if not um, this is it here it is called and it's obviously a translation because some of the English is missing um, the right terminology and things like that but anyway um, study of microstructures on cross-section of Japanese sword so that's the study. It is study of microstructures on cross-section of Japanese sword, specifically a historical sword. This is actually a proper historical sword that they took at and studied the microstructure in it. It is done by the Wakoa Museum in Yasugicho. I'm really bad with the pronunciation. They go through uh, uh, microstructure observations, micro hardness distribution, and that's that's significant as well. And indeed, they find they found that the katana is much much harder towards the edge than the back. And this is remember, it's a historical sword that they're looking at. Indeed, they say an old, famous Japanese sword has been studied meta metallurgically to observe its microstructure by optical micro microscopy and scanning of electron microscopy. Indeed, they call the sword Muramasa. That's a term I've heard before. I forget all the context. Generally, it's um, in reference to a pretty famous sword, Muramasa. Or it's a sword made by someone named Muramasa. Anyway, they call it Muramasa. So I think that should add a bit of credibility as to that this is a historical sword that they're looking at. 
And this is what they found, all right? The sword has a general carbon content of 0.7%, and the amount of non-metallic inclusions in the sword is 50 to 100 times as much as ordinary steel. Now, the ordinary steel that they're referring to is modern steel, modern ordinary steel that we find in the modern day, modern day. 50 to 100 times as much as ordinary steel. So non-metallic inclusion specifically. They say none of the deoxidizer has been used in the Tatara iron making process, which is different from modern iron processes. Lots of oxides and many inclusions originated from the slags remained in the Tamahagane through the smelting reaction. The amount of inclusions is fewer, and the size of those are finer in the sharp edge in comparison with the side and central part of the sword because of repeated forging effect in making the sword. Now, table two, so have a look at the table, shows the composition of non-metallic inclusions in Muramasa second. And this sword, there are several kinds of inclusions, such as silicon dioxide, iron dioxide, titanium dioxide, and aluminium dioxide. On the contrary, ordinary steel has very low contents of inclusions and no iron dioxides and titanium dioxides. The detection of a lot of titanium oxides in non-metallic inclusions indicates that inclusions came from iron sand. Whoa! If you want the smoking gun in regards to the truth about the katana, most of it can be found right here! Remember that last point that they made? Most of the inclusions came from the iron sand that they were using. So if you wanted proof that if you get iron oxide sand and but you know collect it in a traditional way, it's gonna have lots of impurities in it still. Confirmed, right here. Also, that a traditional katana still has a lot of impurities or slag in it, okay? Not nearly as much as what would happen if they didn't forge it, okay? Because remember, without forging, nearly all the slag content is still in there from the Tatara smelting process. And indeed, the parts of the sword that was forged more had less inclusions. It still had inclusions, but less, because the more you forge, the more you can get rid of it. But look at the inclusions that were left, the non-metallic Conclusion specifically, remember, and I listed them as we're reading through them, I'll mention them again. Silicon dioxide, iron dioxide, titanium dioxide, and aluminium dioxide. All of them, each one of them was an oxide, all right? Now remember how I said, you can't burn off something that has already been burnt. An oxide is something that has already been burnt, essentially, because oxygen is bonded to it, and so, the only inclusions left, there was a decent amount of them, and the only types of inclusions left, though, were oxides. And so forging, even though it can remove impurities, okay, it cannot remove oxides. Or at least it can't remove all the oxides in the steel. The way that you want to get pure steel is in the smelting stage, not the forging stage. But again, if your smelting technology isn't up to scratch, you want a forging technique that can fix the problem. And largely, the way that the katana is forged does fix most of the problems left over from their smelting, the way they smelt, smelt stuff. Not smell. Smelt. And so, everything is making sense now. It's all, it's all very clear, okay, that the, the three types of steel that they um, get from the Tatara making process, Hocho Tetsu, Tamahagane and Nabegame all have a lot of non-metallic inclusions in there. They're riddled with slag, and so to fix it, you have to forge the thing. You've got to fold it, and you've got so which will burn off anything that comes close to the surface, all right? Which are non-metallic inclusions, stuff like that, but unfortunately, it's not going to be able to burn off um, every oxide in there. But still, it's going to clean up what was initially quite a mess, all right? And that's with all three types of steel. But the steel that they want to use on the edge, they have obviously figured out that repeated forging will actually decarburize that steel and so that means they need to start out with a steel that had a higher carbon content and that's the nabegame that's the pig iron and so a katana is made out of pig iron in part all right and so they get the tamahagane and the nabegame and they 
interlayer it, they put it into a brick and then they start folding it, which interlaces those different grades of steel, but at the same time decarburizes them. So at the end result, according to the sources that I've found, which is that paper that I mentioned and also that PBS documentary, which is riddled with inconsistencies, but they did state this, that the carbon content, the general carbon content of a katana is 0.7%. Now, 0.1% is about Sorry, not 0.1, 1% is about as high as you would ever want to get with carbon in steel, okay? You wouldn't ever go higher. So 0.7 is pretty high, 1% is the highest, all right? And pig iron has anything between 1.5 to 3% carbon in it. But it's not pig iron anymore because it's been forged and decarburized. But if they didn't use pig iron in the, in the beginning of the forging process, the carbon content that the sword would have at the end would be something like maybe 0.4% carbon and would be nowhere near hard enough. So to fix it, they needed to start out with pig iron. That's the purpose of pig iron, all right? Pig iron is something you make intentionally. So when they say katanas are made out of pig iron, well, that's actually a good thing. If it wasn't, the katana would be out of crap by the end. And remember, something very important, because I've been mentioning that this forging process, well, it can be used to remove impurities, okay? Because that's kind of the accusation that um, folding steel does not remove impurities, it only homogenizes those impurities to make something that can be um, still be mildly effective. Well, it's a bit of both. It will remove the impurities, and the impurities that it can't remove, it will homogenize them, and it will even out the carbon distribution as well. And so the end result is a piece of steel that has even carbon throughout the entire, you know, length of it, and there's no fatal build-ups of slag or non-metallic inclusions at one particular point. It's all even throughout the thing, which makes the sword more than adequate, okay? It actually, you can still get a really good sword that's built this way, okay? Now, are these swords as good as, say, swords that were made in the with superior smelting technology, which means most of the non-metallic inclusions were able to be taken out of the steel when it became fully liquefied? And remember, being fully liquefied, there's non-metallic inclusions, rise to the surface they can skim the slag off so a sword that is forged um, over a sword that was smelted correctly is it superior technically no it can't be superior okay having said that though the way it's quenched and the grade of steel plays a very big part in it okay because you can get steel with that's nearly pure right but if it's not quenched right and it's and it's crystalline internal structure isn't in the right state with the strongest state that you hope which comes from the correct quenching method it won't be as strong as a traditionally made katana that was forged even though it has it still has a certain level of impurities which are oxides in it that the forging process couldn't remove if it is being tempered and forged correctly it will actually be a superior sword compared to the other one and so that plays a big part but if both things being equal where both swords were made to the best quality they could be made, the one that had the slag removed in the smelting process will ultimately always be superior to any sword that was made out of steel that had slag in it, and then that slag was removed through repeated forging and folding. Because the answer is you can't remove all of it that way. Whereas in, with the, in the smelting process, you can remove nearly all of it. So that is how the katana is made, and uh, like I said, more importantly, uh, covering a bit more in depth why it is made the way it is. So I hope you have enjoyed it. Um, I took a lot of research to try and uncover the truth of uh, this subject, but uh, please do follow me on, follow me to the next video, because we're not done yet. So I do hope to see you there.